John 1. Go ahead and find John chapter 1, because maybe we're doing the series through John 1 right now. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say uh, the Advent series has been a lot of fun, because I've just kind of uh, opened my Bible at the beginning of the week and asked the little Lord where he wanted to take us. And so the, the theme, if you will, this week was the humanity of Christ. And uh, I, think, I think this week's going to be a lot of fun. So as you're finding John 1, we're going to be in verses 14 through 18. Um, now, we have a flip book at our house that has all of these questions in it, uh, conversation starters. And sometimes I'll grab that, bring it to the table, we'll use it around the dinner table, and, you know, the questions come up, the answers from our five-year-old and two-year-old are even better than the questions that are presented. And so a couple weeks ago, the question was, if you could be any animal, what would you be? Uh, and so, you know, the, the answers were all over the place, anything from like a shark so you could swim deep into the ocean, or an eagle so that you could soar high above the earth or a cheetah so that you could run really fast. Like there were all of these ideas um, about if you could be anything, like this is what I would be. And in every answer that our boys gave, it was always to push past a limitation. It, it was always to do something that, well, you know, to become an animal that would enable you to do something that you can't currently do. And nobody answers that question and says, well, if I could take on any form, I would love to be a slug. I would love to be a termite. Like, nobody's thinking that whenever they get asked that question. I mean, even a more admirable, you know, animal like a lion, the king of the jungle, like, we wouldn't, we wouldn't set aside something like that feeling we get whenever we're at a wedding and you know, we see these two people saying their vows to each other, and there's just something in you that knows that something otherworldly is taking place. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't set aside that laughter that, you know, fills you with joy whenever there's a friend you haven't seen in maybe a couple years and you catch up. And I mean, you wouldn't trade the embrace of a family member whenever you're going through something difficult. There, there are things that you just say, I wouldn't set aside this for anything. And as I considered that reality this week, I thought, consider Christ, who being God, took on flesh one who took on the form of a human for us, the omnipotent one who is all-powerful, subjected himself to feelings like hunger and thirst and requiring sleep. The one who is the alpha and omega humbled himself to be a child who has to learn the rudimentary alphabet. Consider what Christ has done for us. He who is omnipresent and infinite, taking on the form of a man with fingerprints. Why would God do this? Why would the second person of the Trinity humble himself in such a way? And I believe it's for this reason, to rescue us and to relate to us. The Son of God became man to rescue us and to relate to us. Now, the overarching reason by far is for his glory. All things are for his glory. But how is God most glorified in his incarnation? By rescuing his people and by relating to them exactly where they are. Now, perhaps we come to a subject like the humanity of Christ or the incarnation, and you think that affirming this is simply a matter of an intellectual exercise. You're like, okay, so, you know, break out the theology textbooks. We're going to learn about the incarnation, how Christ was truly human. But I want you to see how personal this is. Because Christ took on humanity, there is no point in which your life, being in a hospital waiting room, or, or the joy of celebrating your birthday, that you can't say, Christ can't relate to me. You see, Christ in his humanity, both knew what it meant to be hopeful and heartbroken. He, knew, he knows what it means to both be exhausted and excited. He experienced the full range of human emotions and as man can relate to you and your humanity, no matter where you are. Not only that, Christ had to be human to rescue humanity. This is an optional doctrine for Christians. We must believe that he is both truly God in every way, and truly man, because he had to come as the second Adam to succeed in his life as the first Adam failed in the garden. If he was to be the substitute for the punishment of humanity's sin, then he must be fully human to be that substitute. You see, if he is not as much human as he is God, then he is disqualified as the savior of man. 
And so he had to be human. Not only that, through Christ's coming, we get an accurate picture of who God the Father is. Consider that for a moment. Whenever you think about Christ the Son and God the Father, how do you think about God the Father? Do you see them as acting the same way? I think sometimes, perhaps, we're tempted to believe that God the Father is, you know, easily annoyed or agitated, or or maybe we think that at best he's just kind of distant and cold. And yet Christ came so that we would truly know the heart of the Father. John 1.18 says, no one has ever seen God, God the Father, but the only God who is the Son, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. John is saying, if you want to know God the Father's heart for you, then look at Christ getting down on his knees to humbly wash the disciples' feet, even the one who would betray him. If you want to know the heart of God to sinners and sufferers, look how patient Jesus is. Look at how his bowels seem to burst with compassion whenever he looks upon his people as sheep without a shepherd. Look at Christ to know the Father's heart, one in essence, united in love for their people. And Jesus is also our example. Jesus gives us a picture of how we can live as Christians Because he is the Christ who has come that we would be united with him, abiding in him, and living like him. I mean, some people think that to be a Christian, you just kind of have to walk around like dull and decaffeinated, right? Nothing can bother you. You're just kind of, you know, emotionless. And yet we see like the humor and wit of Jesus. Whenever two of his disciples are brothers and, you know, they're rambunctious, they're kind of knuckleheads, and he nicknames them the sons of thunder, Uh, You you see the way that he's able to just be wise and navigate really difficult cultural issues. Whenever things like racism are brought up or, or political turmoil and with wisdom and authority, he speaks in a way that the two opposing sides are even brought together. We can look at the way that Jesus lives. Uh, We hear him make jokes about camels going through the eyes of needles. We uh, hear him in the garden. We see his sorrow, so much so that he was called the man of sorrows. He doesn't want to be alone in the garden of Gethsemane, asking that his disciples would stay awake with him. He is truly human. He would teach us what it means to be human. Jesus was the God-man become fully man. Why? So that he could rescue us and so that he could relate to us. So with that laid out, I want to look at John 1, verses 14 through 18. And in many ways, we're going to go cover to cover in the Bible this morning. Uh, But this is a passage that I think is a helpful place for us to drop our anchor as we consider the humanity of Christ. Seeing what we saw last week, that in the beginning Christ already was, that he is fully God. And now John is going to show us that he who is the word became flesh. He took on flesh to dwell among us. So let's read in verses 14 through 18. The word of God says this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, being John the Baptist, bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Speaking of his preexistence, his eternality again. He says in verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Well, what do we see here? We see that the preexistent word took on flesh. That's why we say that Christmas isn't a beginning, but a becoming. Because Christ already was And then he took on the form of a human. He was born. He became man. Uh, Not surrendering anything of his deity, but taking on full humanity. It says here that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt there is interesting because if you look at the original language, it's actually the word tabernacled. So what John is saying here is in the same way that the presence of God was made known to the people of Israel throughout the Old Testament by the tabernacle being among them, the place where sacrifices were made, that that, that atonement took place so that they could know that God was present among them. He's saying, now Christ has tabernacled. The presence of God made known to you through the person of Jesus Christ, that he has come in the flesh. 
Because of that, we have seen his glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He has made the Father known. He is full of grace. And in his graciousness, he does not sacrifice truth. And in his truthness, there's no deviation of his grace. He makes grace and truth known, reflecting the heart of the Father to man in his humanity. Verse 18 says, No one has never seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This same reality is affirmed in the Nicene Creed. Uh, We've been looking at that the the past week or so, and we'll continue to look at it throughout this series because we want to ground what we believe both in Scripture and what the church has held throughout the ages. Church, different denominations, different sects of the church came together and said, despite our differences that we may have, we affirm this about God. They said, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. And this is the stanza we're kind of focusing on today. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We see here in the incarnation that Christ became human without losing anything that he already was. Here he has two unions or two natures, completely in union union and not divided in the least bit, both God and man. Now, some people have opposed this belief. Uh, So perhaps um, those who who are Muslims would, would say that this doctrine, this teaching of Christianity is unbelievable because God, who is almighty, would never take on the form of man. So they, they completely reject this teaching, would, would never say that Jesus is God. But there were also those even closer to early Christianity called the Docetists. And, and this idea of Doceticism was that Jesus appeared to be like a man, but wasn't truly human in every sense. It's interesting that because of the resurrection and because of the miracles, because all of those things were so evident in the early church and in early history that no one doubted the deity of Christ, if there was anything that they thought they might have a chance at attacking, it was the humanity of Christ. Because they knew that only God could do what Christ did. And so they said, he just appears to be a man, but he, but he can't really be man, almost like a mirage, uh, the Gnostics of uh, Christian Gnostics in the early days believed that um, he, he would have never taken on something material. They associated um, material things, something solid or physical, as evil. So they said, well, "Well, God wouldn't do that." They were skewed. They didn't understand how God could take on the form of human and continue to be God. It's almost as if John is trying to stamp out some of these early heresies in First John one through four. Whenever he writes this, that which was from the beginning being Christ, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He said Christ came and he was truly human, being God, but also being fully human. We heard him, we saw him, we touched him with our hands. And as we have already seen, it takes the God-man to be our Savior, the one who rescues us and relates to us. So with that being said, I want to look at kind of three different perspectives on the humanity of Christ. Take three different vantage points. Uh, So picture something like Mount Everest, all right? So uh, perspective one, vantage point one, is going to kind of be from the helicopter, all right, looking down on the Old Testament and all the promises about who Christ was, uh, that he would necessarily be human. And then uh, vantage point two is going to be kind of hiking up Mount Everest and saying, okay, this is, this is how Christ came. Look at him in the New Testament. And then vantage point three is going to kind of be like, you know, taking a couple samples of, of what we've seen and going back to the lab and saying, all right, what are we actually looking at here? 
Like, how does this all make sense? Why did Christ have to be human? And how does that truly affect my day-to-day life? All right, so with that being said, vantage point one is the promise of Christ's humanity in the Old Testament. The promise of Christ's humanity in the Old Testament. The Savior that you would be looking for after reading through the Old Testament promises is an embodied Savior, an embodied Messiah. And it makes the most sense whenever you look back at the Old Testament through the coming of Christ. Uh, There was a Puritan who said um, he compared the Old Testament to a, a chamber richly furnished but dimly lighted. It's a chamber, richly furnished, but dimly lighted. What did he mean? He said that the Old Testament is like this mansion in regards to what it says about Christ. It's like this mansion with magnificent portraits on the wall and ornate furniture lining the living room, stunning architecture all throughout, but it's lit by candle. And then it's almost as if the New Testament comes like a floodlight and you're able to walk through those same halls and see things in ways that you couldn't see before because of how they are illuminated by the clarity of scripture looking back at what was already said. And so with that being the case, I wanna look through some Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and and shed that New Testament light on it so that we can see just how Christ came, that it was necessary, that scripture demanded that Christ would come in human form. Now, with that being said, if you are a note taker, you might just want to relax and sit back this morning, all right? The notes are in the email. You can look at the weekly. You can click on the link. If you try to write all of this down, your pen will catch on fire and you'll be frustrated at me, okay? So that being said, I have shown great restraint in only showing you 12 prophecies that Christ has fulfilled in his coming. And we'll go, we'll go quick, right? So don't worry, guys. Don't, don't stress out. All right. First... Christ is the seed of the woman that crushes Satan. From the moment that sin entered the garden, God made a promise to Eve, and he said that there was one who will come from your line, the seed of the woman. And although his heel will be bruised, the head of the serpent will be crushed. The seed will come. There was one, they were looking for one who would come in human form to do this. And 1 John 3.8 3, declares, the Son of God appeared and destroyed the works of the devil. Promise given, promise fulfilled by an embodied Messiah. He's the offspring of Abraham that blesses the world. Before Abraham had a single child of his own and before God ever told him to go out and number the stars, he said, there is one who will come from your line that will bless all the families of the earth. Because that is the case. It should not surprise us in Galatians 3.16, whenever Paul says, hey, remember whenever God said in Genesis 12 that a seed would come? Do you realize that was singular? That he's talking about a specific man who would come? Whenever you read the genealogies of Jesus and you look through his family tree in Matthew and Luke, whose name do you see there? Abraham. Christ came as the one born through the line of Abraham who would bless all the families of the earth. He's the king from the line of David. See, God promised King David that there would be one who would reign on his throne forever. And what does the angel declare to Mary in Luke 132? He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. He's the God who is with us. In Isaiah 7, 14, God promised that he would be near to his people and something unique would happen in history whenever a virgin gave birth. He said that the child that would come from her womb would be not like no other and you would call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Fast forward to Matthew 123 when Joseph finds out that the wife in which he has not known has now just announced to him that she is pregnant. He's kind of wondering what to do. Maybe I should just kind of let this relation go quietly and, and break off the engagement. And what does the angel say? He says, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah seven fourteen. He hears in a vision, your son is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the light that illuminates the darkness. Isaiah declared with great specificity that there would be one who would come like a light and he would not only be the Messiah, but that he would do ministry in the region of Galilee. 
In Matthew, whenever he's making a summary statement about the ministry of Jesus in Matthew 4.16, he said that the light has come and the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. He is the light that makes this mansion well lit. He is the spirit-filled Messiah. Isaiah 11.2 says that the spirit of the Lord God would rest upon him who is coming. And what do we hear whenever he comes out of the baptism waters? That the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Matthew 3.16, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 11.2. He is the shepherd who will come to lead. Isaiah promises that the Lord would come, not far off, but like a shepherd. Proximity is communicated here. He is a shepherd who is present with his people, knowing the needs of his people. And what does Jesus announce to those around him in John 10.11? I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd who has come, and I lay down my life for my sheep. He is the sheep that was led to the slaughter. Isaiah 53 depicts this man of sorrows who would come, the Messiah, who would be crushed for the iniquities and sins of his people. Through his wounds, we would be healed. Like a sheep before his shears, he would be silent. And then the high priest begins to question him in Matthew 26, and he opens not his mouth just as prophesied and promised. He said nothing. His grave, just as prophesied, was that. With a rich man, he borrowed it for a few days because he didn't need it for long. He was the sheep who was slain and the lion who is risen. He's the messenger that brings good news. Isaiah 61 declares, look for the one that the spirit of the Lord God would be upon. He will come. He will bring good news to the poor. He will bind up the brokenhearted and he will proclaim liberty to the captives setting them free. Jesus goes into a synagogue around Luke 4, 16 through 19, asks for the scroll of Isaiah, unrolls it to chapter 61, reads these words, one who is coming, who will bring good news to the poor, he will bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives. And he sits down and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am the one you have been looking for. He's the son of man who is eternal See, Daniel, in the midst of Babylonian captivity, clung to a hope that there is one who was coming who would set them free. He said that he saw this vision. He didn't fully comprehend it, but there was one who was like the ancient of days, speaking of God the Father. And in his presence, there was one whom he saw that was like the son of man, trying to fit all the pieces together. He knew that he was seeing something far greater than himself. And whenever the religious leaders questioned Jesus and said, who do you think you are? He said, I am the son of man who is seated at the right hand of God. He who Daniel saw is standing before you now. He's the eternal one that is born in Bethlehem. Micah said that there is one who is coming. He's from old. He is from ancient days. And yet he'll be born like a child in Bethlehem. And in Matthew 2, 1, the birth of Christ is announced And its location on the map is the city of Bethlehem. He's the pierced Savior. Zechariah foretold a moment in which God's people would look upon him whom they have pierced with their sin. What did that mean? What did it mean to look upon him who was pierced by their sins? Doubting Thomas knew. Because in Luke 24, Jesus stretched out his hand and said, See my hands? In my feet, that it is myself, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you can see that I have. Thomas ran his finger over the scabs on Jesus' hand and said, my Lord and my God. He who was prophesied and promised came in the flesh. Jesus, whenever he was talking to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, said this, He's explaining kind of everything that has gone on. And he said, well, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What does this tell you about your God? That he desires to be known. Isn't that amazing? That God in his great transcendence desires for us to know him. Life like a mist lowly, messing things up, getting things wrong, and God, God of the universe desires to know us. Think about that for a moment. Uh, think about if, if you were to today receive an email or a phone call 
from a celebrity that you admire or a professional athlete that you follow? What if, what if you got a Twitter notification from someone that you're just like, oh, like, I, I love this person. And they said, hey, would you, would you want to grab breakfast tomorrow morning? Oh, you would be overjoyed. You're like, I, you know, if they just simply liked my post, that would be amazing. But they actually want to like spend time with me and get to know me. We feel that way about another human. Now amplify that to like a million that the God of the universe would humble himself to the point of wanting to know us? That he cares about the things that you're stressed out about right now? That he said, you know what, I'm not just gonna declare my my word through the heavens so that you gotta try to remember it. I'm gonna put it in written form that you hold it in your hands and hear my promises to you on a daily basis. I'm not just gonna say, you know what, uh, remember these, these feasts and festivals, you know when the holidays are? No, he says, Because of the resurrection of my son, I want to create a moment every single week in which you find rest by worshiping with the people of God. He says, I love you so much that my spirit is going to indwell your brothers and sisters in faith that whenever you are with them, in a sense, you get a glimpse of what I'm like and how I care for you. He's the God who desires to be known. These promises show that. They display his faithfulness. They remind us, as Psalm 16, 11 says, that in his presence there is fullness of joy and in his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The second vantage point we see, if you will, is the proof of Christ's humanity in the New Testament. So by the end of the Old Testament, it's safe to say that everybody knew who they were looking for. They were looking for God who would come as man. They were looking for an embodied Messiah, a couple weeks ago, I was meeting somebody on a Saturday at the Madison Place that I had only exchanged emails with. I'd never met them before. I didn't know what they looked like. And so there I am sitting in the middle of the coffee shop, knowing that I'm looking for a guy named Doug. He knowing that he's looking for a guy named Terry Lee and neither one of us having any idea what the other one looked like. And so there was another guy who was just wandering around the coffee shop and he said, Terry Lee. And I said, Doug. And it was this great moment in which, you know, all the blinders came off and we were like, all right, we're supposed to meet together. Okay, that was not happening for the people who were reading the Old Testament and wondering who this Messiah would be like. They're like, oh, born in Bethlehem. Okay, descendant of David. Yes, Abraham's family tree. Okay, we, we know what we're looking for. And then he came in human form. And the New Testament proves his humanity in a myriad of ways. First, we know that Jesus was born. He had a birthday. He took on flesh. He was carried in the womb of Mary for nine months. He was literally born. Second, we know that he grew and developed. Luke 2.40 says that Jesus grew. He became strong. He was filled with wisdom. As, As immutable God in his deity, completely unchanging, in his humanity, he grew and developed. Luke 2.52 gives us a glimpse of Christ's childhood by stating that he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus embraced the limitations of humanity. I think it's important here to let you know what I am saying and what I am not saying. By emptying himself or by limiting himself and taking on servanthood, he wasn't losing his deity but adding humanity. Philippians 2, 6 through 7 says this, that though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. It's emptying through addition, not subtraction. All right, so imagine that you buy a you know, fancy new sports car this week um, or, or something like that, and then you take it and you're like, I don't care if I've got to you know, take back roads to my house, no big deal, it doesn't matter. And so you just kind of go through this trail, um, uh, completely avoiding the pavement, and now this brand new, beautiful sports car is covered with mud. Now, its appearance is less than But did it lose the shiny luster of the paint underneath the mud? No, not at all. You see, by by taking on, by addition, it almost has the appearance of subtraction. But through addition, it is experiencing some sort of emptying. Christ, in the same way, by taking on humanity, has not lost his deity. But for a time, he embraced limitation so that he could relate to us. You could almost say it or compare it to this. Uh, if, if I'm wrestling with my boys in the floor, 
I do not use the full force of being a 32-year-old adult whenever we are wrestling. No, I I show some restraint. Uh, If anything, I'm getting the brunt of that attack. And yet, for a little while, I I show great restraint for the purpose of being able to, to relate to them, to get on their level. And at the same time, if there was an intruder that burst into our house, I would, I would use my full force to protect my family. Christ never let up his deity, but, but embraced limitation for the sake of being able to relate to us and fulfilling what was demanded of humanity in our place. Uh, so, for example, he is omnipotent, all-powerful, and yet needed sleep, needed to eat. He is all wise and yet learned. He, he is omnipresent, but in his humanity, he was in a location in time. Now, this is a mystery how this all fits together, how these two natures are together at once, his human nature and his, his divine nature. And, and we don't want to just kind of, you know, while we understand there are distinctions, it's not helpful for us to try to make a division. We, we recognize mystery here. And yet we see that Christ took on limitation for us. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was genuinely tempted. In Matthew 4, Satan tries to tempt Jesus by saying there is an easy way to glory that can completely avoid the cross. And what does he do? Even when he is tempted, he is without sin, as Hebrews 4 says. This is good news for us. Do you ever feel like you have committed a sin when you're tempted? Understand that Christ was tempted here and committed no sin. That in fact, the moment that you are tempted is a great moment in which you can exercise faith and rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't feel guilty if you're tempted. Use that as a moment to be like Christ, even in the midst of temptation. Jesus experienced a full range of emotions. He loved Lazarus and he wept when he died. He had compassion on the multitudes. The word there is splagna. It's almost like this stomach ache that he got because he loved his people so much. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was deeply troubled. He desired that his friends would be with him. He was amazed. He marveled at the faith of a Gentile. He experienced every emotion that you and I do, but not in a sinful way. Think about that for a moment. It's okay for you to cry out to God when you're sad. Don't be too spiritual to be sad with God. Whenever you're excited about something, guess who wants to hear about that? God. Use that as a moment in which it's a diving board to praise God. Around our dinner table every night, we got this from the Jacksons, we do something called highs and lows. We talk about the high of our day and the low of our day. And when we talk about our high, we say, this this was the high of my day. And it's something we can praise God for together. This is the low of my day. This is something I I was really discouraged by. I need to help navigating through this and understanding the sovereignty of God in the midst of this, right? You know, in in different words, right, with with our children, but the same sentiment. God wants you to come to him with your, you know, I mean, the early fathers called it consolations and desolations, your highs and lows. God, this is what's going on. Not only that, Jesus suffered and died. The passion accounts of Jesus reveal his humanity by detailing the suffering he experienced. Christ suffered in your place, which means he is the one to talk to in the waiting room. He's the one to talk to whenever you're hoping that that pregnancy test would be positive and it's not. He's the one to talk to whenever you had all these grand plans and it feels like they're sifting through your fingers. That Christ suffered and he gets it. And Christ died for you. Not only that, he was raised in a glorified body. I love that. Like Mary's at the tomb, she's weeping and then she sees this guy and she thinks it's the gardener and she's like, I guess I'll talk to you. Do you know where they put him? And then he says, Mary, she's a rabbi. That's you. You're in the form of flesh. The guys on on the road to Emmaus, they see him. He goes, his disciples are all scared. And he's like, peace be with you. He's he's a man in a glorified body. In his resurrection, he doesn't just do away with his body. No, he gives us hope that these aching bodies we have will one day be fully restored. That, That the Christian brother or sister or family member that you love that is crippled by disease right now in the presence of Christ will be able to jump with joy will be fully healed and restored because our Savior is glorified and forever embodied on our behalf. What does this show us about Jesus? That he is approachable. I mean, I mean yes, he's holy. We, I mean, he demands reverence. And at the same time, what does he say? 
come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, come to me. He, he doesn't give us a map. He doesn't say, this is where I'm at if you want to find me. He doesn't say, oh, I'm free between 9 and 10 on Tuesdays if, if you ever get the chance. He doesn't say, I'll meet you halfway. No. He says, I went all the way for you so you can just come to me, so that you can know me. Do you ever feel intimidated? Like whenever you're, I mean, uh, maybe a silly example, but it's like, man, if you see somebody, you know, in, like working out in the gym, and you're just like, man, that guy is jacked. Like, I want to ask him like how he did that, but I'm me. And so I'm really intimidated to just be like, there's a lot that has to happen before I look like this. Like, how do I get there? You know, maybe you, maybe you want somebody's help and you're like, no, they're, I mean, they're so smart. They're so attractive. They're like so far along. Look at all they have, have accomplished. Like if I go to them, they'll be like, who is this? And consider Christ and his perfection. Like, I mean, holy. Doing everything that we were supposed to do perfectly. And yet so approachable. I mean, look at how patient he is. Look at, look at him saying, I want to create a dinner where all the sinners and all the tax collectors and prostitutes feel comfortable hanging out with me. And I'm the son of God. Jesus is exceedingly approachable. Consider that in your evangelism. Like, are you excited to tell people about a Jesus like that? The son of God becoming man so that you could come to him and have life in his name, separated by sin, and then yeah, he just takes it all on himself to bring you to the throne of God? That's awesome. Third perspective, the purpose of Christ's humanity in rescuing us. Up to this point, we've dealt with prophecy, history, if you will, um, through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now we're going to kind of look at theology, all right? So uh, there's, there's fact and there's truth, isn't there? Consider this for a moment. Because truth is not less than facts, but truth is certainly more than fact. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? Well, um, if I was to say, hey, here's this letter, and I want you to hold this letter in your hand, and this letter has 47 sentences in it. And, and that means that it has, you know, 35 exclamation marks and I can't do quick math on the fly, so the rest are periods. And, you know, you're just like, you're, you're describing this letter and you're like, wow, facts. But then you hold that same letter in your hand and you begin reading it. And it was written to you from a grandparent that passed away 10 years ago. You never saw it. It's kind of tucked away in their drawer. And man, your heart is like filled with an affection that you like haven't experienced in years. That's truth. Whenever you take the facts, and you don't just rattle them off. That's one of the problems I think with our culture. We just become so disenchanted and disillusioned. We have to deconstruct everything. And you know, it's like facts are good, but truth, truth pushes beyond and says, what do I make of all this? That's what we see here, that Christ gives us truth. He is the sinless man. Why did it matter that he was born of a virgin? Is this just kind of something that we say, oh, this is miraculous, so that we know that he is the son of God because he's born on a virgin? No, there's more there. You see that he had to be born of a virgin. Mary in Luke 1 says, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel says, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. You see, because Joseph was not involved, because man was not involved, the sinful nature of man inherited from Adam was not passed down. So Christ could come in human nature, born of woman, and yet not inherit sinful nature of Adam. How does all that work? I don't really know. But I do know that's what scripture teaches, that because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit of a virgin, he is holy and able to represent us as one who was without sin. Not only that, he's the second Adam, our representative. Adam acting as our federal head, our representation in the garden condemned all of humanity. All right, so if you made some mistakes this week, you haven't made one that big. But Christ coming as Messiah, we see, acts as representative second Adam. Romans 5, 19 says, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is called the active obedience of Christ. The covenant of works that was broken by Adam is now fulfilled by Christ on your behalf. 
so that he could say, this is my righteousness and I'm imputing it to you. I'm, I'm writing the check that accredits all of it to your spiritual bank account. As Gregory of Nazianza says, that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. But because he has become fully human, he is able to heal us to the uttermost. He is our substitute for sin. Banner in the back says, the gospel is Jesus in my place. What does that mean? That Christ has come as our substitute, that he has assumed all of our sin and the penalty for it. This necessitates that he would be fully human to die for humanity. Romans 8 Verses three, or verse three says, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, which means all of your sins were placed upon him. He is the first fruits of our resurrection. We know that our bodies will one day com- be completely resurrected and restored because Christ's body was. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So when our bodies ache and whenever we breathe our last breath here, we can know with great hope that there is a day coming in which we will be restored to a glorified body as Christ has and as we will inherit He is the priest that can intercede for us. I think we often talk a lot about what Christ has accomplished, but we don't talk often about what Christ is doing right now. And in his intercession, he applies what he has already accomplished. Hebrews 7, 24 through 25 says, he holds his priesthood permanently. He who was the sacrifice for our sins now pleads as the living sacrifice to God the Father, as our ever-present advocate. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I mean, think about that for a moment. If someone who says, hey, I'm, you know, I'm pardoning this stain on your record, or, you know, hey, uh, I mean, something as, as small as, um, I know that you live here, but, you know, your neighbor lives here, and they say, you can park in, in our yard anytime. You can park in my driveway anytime. You know, we, we walk to work, whatever. Now, the, the, the thing you would worry about is if they ever move and sell their house, I lose that privilege or could potentially lose that privilege. Christ is saying, I hold this priesthood forever. What what does it say right there in verse 24? He continues forever. He will never be moved. His sacrifice will always be applied because he is eternal. He can always intercede for you, which means he is constantly directing the gaze of the father to his righteousness, saying, behold, your child who is perfect and sinless because of what I did on their behalf. He is the example we followed. One church father says Jesus, become, Jesus became what we are that we might become what he is. This is the process of sanctification. 1 Peter 2, 21 says that Christ has left us an example that we may follow in his steps. I mean, look at the life of Christ. Uh, we see him dealing with difficult people. One time his, his mom and his brothers came to get him because they thought that he was acting crazy. And we see that he is patient with them and he handles that situation well. Uh, we see that his disciples were constantly messing up, overstepping, and, you know, outspoken. And what does he do? He comes alongside them and teaches them. He was single, and yet in his relationships with other men and women, he, he was always respectful and kind. Uh, we see the way that, that he loves other people. And you think, man, I want to love my spouse like that. Uh, we look at the way that and people wanted Jesus to be at parties, And things got better when Jesus was there. People wanted him around. We looked at the life of Jesus and we aimed to be like that. But not only do we say this is just an example to follow, but the fact that he has died for us to cleanse us from our sin, place his Holy Spirit in us by uniting us with him and now enabling us to live in this way. Finally, he is the savior that can sympathize with us. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, as Cush read earlier, says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace and help to help in our time of need. He's able to sympathize with us. He doesn't stand far off. 
I've heard sympathy described as your pain in my heart. Is that not what Christ did? He came to experience our pain in his heart. The pain of sin, the punishment of its consequences, the yearning to be in a loving relationship with God that we were created for, that he would go to the cross and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me so that we as God's enemies would be welcomed in and called son or daughter? Now he's the priest who can sympathize with us because he lived as us yet without sin. So that in our time of need, which I don't know about for you, but is ever present for me, I could call upon him and receive grace and mercy. Because of that, Christ is patient toward those who struggle. He is near to those who are broken hearted. He comforts those who hurt and he guides those that are confused. He gives strength to the weary and he heals the broken. And there's not a single moment in your life that you can say, Christ just doesn't understand because he does. He's able to sympathize with your weakness and he invites you to come to him because his grace is sufficient in your time of need. He's the Messiah who was promised. And we see the proof of his humanity throughout the New Testament. And here we find the purpose of it all to rescue us and to relate to us. Behold, our Savior has come fully God and fully man to rescue and relate to humanity. Let's pray.